pleased to welcome our own Scott Nesbitt. Here is our speaker tonight. Uh, Scott is a associate professor of digital humanities here at the University of Georgia's Col College of Environment and Design. Um, his work explores the intersection between digital tools and humanistic questions, um, and particularly questions that touch on the history and spaces here in the American South. Um, he's got a PhD from the University of Virginia, and um, he was uh, at the University of Richmond, director of the Digital Scholarship Lab uh, between 2009 to 2014 when you came here to UGA, and he's been here ever since. Here at UGA, he's leading digital history projects, uh, inclu including um, projects such as Visualizing Emancipation. And you can find that online, um, some of the work that he's done there. And more recently, Scott was a founding uh, member of the historic, member of the History of Slavery at UGA project, HSUGA. And I'm sure many of you have seen some of the work that he's done, including an incredible film that, um, that tours some of the, um, you know, some of the historic sites on UGA and, and looks at some of that difficult history that, that uh, is here at UGA. So um, thank you for being here. I think what we're going to hear tonight is a little bit uh, some of the newer research that you've been looking at. So, so welcome, Scott, and, and thank you all for being here. Well, well, thanks very much, Alfie. Um, yeah, I, I want to thank um, the Environmental Ethics uh, Certificate uh, for the seminar series for inviting me here. Um, and today, uh, as Alfie mentioned, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things I've been thinking about over the past couple years, uh, really since uh, the West Downtown Historic District was, uh, was created and was first proposed, frankly, in um, uh, about 2019 or so. Um, and uh, you know the, the point of this uh, historic district, it, it had actually a, several different points to it, and that's part of the tension that got brought out uh, in the process of its passing, and in, and in the kind of um, unorthodox uh, shape that it eventually took. Uh, usually you don't want historic districts with, as they say, jagged edges or holes in the middle of them. Um, this one has both. And uh, so I, I think it's a, it's a curious case study in, uh, in what preservation looks like today um, and the kinds of tensions and, and possibilities, really, that it holds. Um, in fact, uh, what I'd like to suggest is that Hot Corner lies at the intersection, uh, not just of, say, Hull and Washington or something like that, uh, but rather at the intersection of capital and cultural heritage in the 21st century. Uh, that the fight over the West Downtown Historic District, which, which surrounds but does not include uh, much of what we would consider hot corner today, uh, sheds light on the dynamics of historic preservation. And at the heart of this fight uh, over the West Downtown Historic District and over uh, how cultural heritage would be recognized here in Athens, are questions about what scholars uh, writing since the 1960s or so uh, have called the right to the city. At least that's what I would like to argue. Um, uh, a, uh, a, a theorist named uh, Henri Lefebvre coined this term, right to the city. He did so in 1968, uh, just as uh, there was a kind of uh, large scale, frankly, uh, student rebellion. In, Par in and around Paris, among other, other spots. Um, and this term, right to the city, has been defined in various ways by different interpreters. But here I'd like to follow uh, David Harvey's explanation. David Harvey is a, an urban geographer uh, who's been writing um, really since basically that same time and he's still active. Um, uh, his explanation, which directly ties our deepest desires for human flourishing directly to the processes of capital accumulation and urban redevelopment. So Harvey says, uh, and I'll, I'll read a longer quote, but this, what you see here is embedded in it. He says, the, the question of what kind of city we want cannot be divorced from the question of what kind of people we want to be, what kinds of social relations we seek, what relations to nature 
we cherish, what style of daily life we desire, what kinds of technologies we deem appropriate, what aesthetic values we hold. The right to the city is therefore far more than a right of individual access to the resources that the city embodies. It is a right to change ourselves by changing the city more after our heart's desire. It is moreover a collective rather than an individual right, since changing the city inevitably depends upon the exercise of a collective power over the processes of urbanization. The freedom to make and remake ourselves and our cities is, I want to argue, one of the most precious yet most neglected of our human rights. And uh, Harvey wrote that kind of just as the financial crisis of 2008 was coming about uh, in an essay that he uh, penned for the New Left Review. And what he had in mind really uh, was the, the kinds of uh, ways in which uh, capital accumulation and basically like profit, right, gets invested in various things in our world, right? It gets invested in industrial processes, it gets invested in, um, into, uh, you know, new factories and all kinds of things like that. But one of the main ways that it gets reinvested is it gets invested in our cities, specifically in the redevelopment of our cities. And so uh, when you think about uh, something like, and when you know, he refers and kind of thinks directly about these things, um, when you think about uh, the uh, renovation of Paris in the 19th century uh, under Haussmann or uh, Robert Moses's work in New York City, right? These kinds of, uh, of innovations in uh, the urban spaces that uh, Parisians or New Yorkers uh, were kind of living in in daily life, um, that uh, th these are, this, this dismantling of kind of normal and daily life um, was a, uh, an impingement upon urban dwellers' right to their city, right? And so if they are going to reclaim those rights, they need to, um, as he says, uh, establish some kind of democratic control over the deployment of the surpluses of profits through urbanization. In other words, uh, we as citizens need to figure out how to express our desire in collective action by shaping the way that capital shapes us, right? Shaping the way that our cities are, um, are managed, right? And I would say that the fight over West Downtown is an example of this, right? It, that Athens today is a kind of flashpoint. And it's not a central node for capital development globally, right? But it is a kind of flashpoint. Um, and I'd like to explore that. Um, it's important to see the emergence of luxury student housing and the assault on old buildings downtown, in and around downtown as part of this larger fight. Okay, would be my, my argument. Uh, holding, for example, the khaki line. Uh, you all may be familiar with this term. Um, it, I, I've seen it as far back as 2015 or so, uh, but uh, it's taken from uh, the uh, mostly undergraduate young men who wear khakis uh, and inhabit mostly the east side of downtown. Roughly Lumpkin Street divides uh, kind of the khaki, is the khaki line that divides undergraduate downtown Athens from, uh, from where the townies hang. Uh, the, the part of Athens that uh, Grace Hale was perhaps referring to, the kind of descendants of the parts of Athens that Grace Hale was referring to in her recent book, Cool Town. Um, so that's part of this. Uh, the fight for the West Downtown Historic District was specifically part of this fight connecting a vision for who some townies want to be and connecting that with the longer history of black liberation in Athens. And this is an uneasy kind of alliance is what I'd like to suggest, right? That you have these different goals, these different 
uh, layered historical processes, these different uh, imaginations of what uh, the city can and ought to be, uh, that we're kind of finding here and there points of, uh, of common interest, common goals, um, both in, allied against a kind of threat to the city, uh, a threat that's been expressed in the material uh, landscape of the city in really dramatic fashion. You know, if you're driving down a Coney Street, for example, after coming out of uh, downtown, or you know, maybe across um, uh, across Doherty Street uh, when you look at the the, un the uncommon Athens, right? I mean, th these are kind of real, or Georgia Heights, right? These are really um, dramatic interventions of capital in our daily lives, um, and the expression of a right to the city uh, could restrain some of that. Um, I mentioned these uh, differing goals and these visions, uh, one of which is a vision of uh, black liberation, uh, which is expressed, I, I mean, just so poignantly in uh, the Athens, the hot corner um, mural, uh, it dates uh, from just la last year. Uh, it was uh, unveiled uh, Elio Mercado and uh, Broderick Flanagan, uh, both uh, were participants in, in the creation of this mural. Um, which is right, sits right there in Hot Corner, right? Um, as a testament to, uh, to African-American uh, culture, culture and arts. Um, these, uh, the images also include uh, uh, Homer Wilson uh, cutting hair, as well as in the top, uh, my left corner, uh, Pink Morton, uh, founder of the Morton Theater and uh, tremendous businessman. In fact, uh, this, uh, this hot corner, uh, which uh, is, is at the corner, um, you know, on Hull Street, uh, is, and kind of where the Morton building is kind of one of the anchors of this, uh, of this district. Uh, it was in the early 20th century, uh, both the main, the principal black business district and uh, the farthest outpost of black respectability in an otherwise white downtown, okay? So you have to imagine that the, the downtown grid that we know today um, was almost exclusively white in the Jim Crow era. Um, but uh, there was this one piece of uh, African-American Athens that uh, was anchored uh, by the Morton Theater, by the businesses around the Morton Theater, and then ran from there uh, at this kind of southernmost part up Hull Street, so that uh, you would have um, have had African American businesses and homeowners kind of lining both sides of Hull Street uh, from uh, from there on up. Um, these are just a, a couple of the businesses that existed. Uh, you know, I, I, the Athens Republique is a black newspaper uh, that was um, uh, being published in the 1920s, and so these are advertisements from that newspaper. Uh, the Trinity Publication Society, which, is, which was publishing actually the Republique, uh, was right there at 343 Hull Street, just, uh, just a block or so from uh, the Morton Theater as well, and the Morton, what they call the Morton Drug, Drug Company. Uh, also, the Samaritan Building was on uh, right there on Hull Street as well, uh, no longer uh, standing, unfortunately. Um, you know, they, they, these advertisements often had little taglines that uh, somewhat humorous taglines. Let me show you my contract and be convinced that it is the best yet. See me uh, for your insurance before it's too late. Um, to, you know, today is the time. Tomorrow may be too late. Uh, for, uh, for your insurance needs. Uh, and so uh, Black Athens kind of extended up Hull Street, but then after you got away from downtown, you also had a, a substantial black presence uh, uh, west of that area, right? So if you, once you got out of downtown, uh, the area that is now in the Reese Street Historic District was uh, a primarily African-American part of town in easy walking distance. Uh, of, of Hot Corner. Um, and so here are a couple of the advertisements 
of businesses that uh, were again in the 1920s. Uh, the place to get your money's worth, Fuse Grocery Store, and uh, the Pope Street Cash Grocery, the store of quality. Uh, here, here's a map just so that you, we can all know where we're talking about here. Uh, so uh, Hot Corner being, uh, let me see, um, over here at uh, Hull Street uh, and Washington. So these, this is the area that we're really talking about for Hot Corner. Um, there were, in fact, 66 cataloged black businesses uh, that, uh, that were in this part of Athens. And uh, among the people who were right there in Hot Corner uh, and had offices there were Ida Mae Hiram, the first black female dentist uh, in, uh, in town, as well as Blanche Thompson, Dr. Blanche Thompson, uh, Athens' first African-American uh, woman who was uh, practicing medicine. She was a, a surgeon, a remarkable uh, both businesswoman and, uh, and doctor. Now, this presence of, uh, res of black respectability that had a, this cultural component, it had this business component, it was uh, focused uh, in really uh, very real ways on uh, community health. Uh, this outpost uh, was only one expression of uh, the ways in which uh, African Americans claimed their own right to the city in a segregated space in which they had essentially been disfranchised uh, and were kept from voting, kept from really having any of the kinds of democratic controls on urban development and redevelopment that we think as essential and the, the kinds of tools that, in fact, uh, black and white Athenians use every day to attempt to uh, constrain cap capital development. Um, and express their, their right to the city. But the right to the city in these days were expressed sometimes in less formal ways. Um, this photograph is not from Athens, it's from Richmond, Virginia. And, uh, it was taken in 1905 at an Emancipation Day uh, celebration and parade. And this is the kind of practice uh, that here in the American South, African Americans took to during the Jim Crow era, right? Yeah. People dressed to the nines. They went out uh, on a given uh, Emancipation Day. Sometimes that was celebrated in, in some places in April, uh, as, as in Richmond, Virginia. Sometimes that was celebrated uh, at, in what has become a national holiday, Juneteenth, right? Uh, and someday, sometimes, uh, like here in Athens, uh, it, it was celebrated January 1st. Uh, there was a contest among black Athenians for physical, civic, and historical space that was waged through celebrations, parades, and other public rituals. Um, here I'm paraphrasing uh, the historian Elsa Barkley Brown, who was writing actually about Richmond, Virginia. Uh, when she and Greg Kimball actually uh, were writing this. And like in Richmond, black Athenians marked out some of their mental maps through parade routes. Um, they created a city space as an amalgam of fluid public spaces and institutions culturally defined by the inhabitants there. Through marching to celebrate emancipation, black Athenians marked out the boundaries of their urban space and lay claimed their right to the city uh, and here in uh, this January 7th edition of the Athens Republic, uh, there's a really rich description of the kinds of celebrations that you uh, saw in that image of Richmond, Virginia, but which uh, were happening here in Athens. Um, pursuant to the proclamation, and here I'll quote a little bit from that newspaper, uh, Pursuant to the proclamation of the Athens Historical Society, the people of Athens joyously and enthusiastically celebrated the 59th anniversary of their freedom on January 2nd, 1922. They proceeded from the Morton Theater, right, which is where uh, Athens, Black Athens gathered together on that day. Off down Hull Street to Broad Street here, and they walked down to Broad Street West to Rock Spring, 
So west all the way, they processed all the way down Broad to Rock Springs Street, to, and then to Hancock Avenue. And then from Hancock, thence along Hancock, back to Hull, all the way back to Hull and down to the Morton. Halting in front of Harris's drugstore, which was within the Morton Theater, the band and battalion pulled off their very best and held the great crowd spellbound for nearly an hour. Right, so here you have just after uh, New Year's Day in January of, of 1922 in the deeply segregated uh, Athens, an Athens that um, uh, frankly, uh, historian Nancy McLean wrote uh, a book about the Athens clan, which was operating at exactly this time. Uh, that clan, that book is called Behind the Mask of Chivalry uh, and goes in to great detail about uh, the kind of operations of the clan and, and the violence that was going on, the racial violence that was going on at this exact moment in time. And so this is the time in which you have this kind of raucous yet respectable crowd kind of going down the streets, marking out the city as their own, including uh, this kind of outpost in downtown. Entering the theater, spectators, uh, the article goes on to say, beheld a beautifully decorated auditorium. The artistic designs of Mrs. Lily, Lizzie Smith, Mrs. A. B. Derricott, Mrs. Nora M. Powell, Mrs. Hattie Grimes, Miss Katie Lee, and Miss Annabelle Allen representing the Social Artistique Club. These ladies showed the ability of French artists. And then featuring Dr. Ernest Hall of Atlanta, uh, who, who gave an address inside the Morton Theater on the significance of the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, the article uh, summarized, uh, Dr. Hall, was the greatest document that had been heard since Moses enunciated the Ten Commandments on Sinai's Heights. There is no phase in the complicated lives of the American Negroes that Dr. Hall did not touch in a practical and constructive way. In other words, uh, black liberation was specifically situated in place and in time connecting Israel's exodus and the giving of the Mosaic Law at Mount Sinai with the American Emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation, and incarnating that black liberation in Athens, Georgia, and in Hot Corner via parades in buildings and in buildings built by and for black Athenians in the decades after emancipation, right? So this is the kinds of ways, the, the kinds of uh, uh, political statements that uh, were able to be made. Um, now about this parade, uh, just a, a couple things about it. Uh, when you look at the, the routes along which uh, they paraded, uh, these were essentially outlining the kind of uh, black, extend, the extension of black downtown, the extension of hot corner. You think about, uh, for example, uh, Hull Street, uh, which they walked down. Now they walked the opposite way on Hull. They walked through White Hull Street uh, from the Morton Theater, which uh, was at about 280 or so Hull Street, and they walked south, which is, which is up uh, the, the numbers through uh, along uh, really substantial white dwellings, frankly. Uh, down, up, when I say up, I mean south, right? But it's up in terms of uh, this list. Um, and they went to, to Broad Street. Uh, but you'll notice that if they had gone the other way on Hull, right, uh, this was a kind of, uh, this was one of the spines of African American uh, life and residence uh, here in the area that's now downtown Athens. Um, you might also recognize that this went all the way up uh, a number of blocks. And what is at kind of, if you keep going on Hull Street, uh, you, you start walking, you go past what, the uncommon, right? Uh, you go to Bethel Homes, uh, which uh, was flattened in the 1960s uh, to create Bethel Homes, right? This was an African-American community at the time um, and is now actually in the process of redevelopment. I don't know how many of you have been following it, uh, but uh, the redevelopment of this, uh, this space is, um, reflects this kind of Athens as flashpoint and 
uh, and Black Athens and Hot Corner as, uh, as sites that are um, in the process of redevelopment and, and really, frankly, um, redevelopment threat. They went from there to Broad Street and they walked up Broad Street. Um, I, I didn't mention this on the previous slide, but uh, you can tell uh, in these city directories, this directory is from this exact time. So it's, this is a 1921 city directory. So these people were living here uh, along this route uh, as these, uh, these folks were processing by. Um, African Americans in city directories had, af had asterisks at, in many points uh, again, uh, next to their names. Um, this was done clearly for uh, yeah, not great reasons, right? Uh, but what you can see here is that after, after downtown in Broad Street, what, what you get is actually African-American Athens, right? Uh, living along Broad Street as it goes down the hill where the Holiday Inn is now, right? Past Pulaski, and then all the way out to Rock Springs Street. If you look, uh, Rock Springs Street likewise was, uh, was African-American uh, residences, uh, as, as was Reese Street and Hancock Street, uh, uh, in many spots anyway, Hancock was. Uh, but they're really just kind of outlining uh, the Reese Street historic district in, in many ways and, uh, and extending it. Uh, so this is what Hancock looked like, right? So uh, in downtown, up through the 400 block, it was white, and then it uh, switches after you get to Pulaski or so, and it became African-American Athens. Um, now, uh, this kind of structure of early 20th century black Athens uh, has a, a geography to it uh, that is important today. And um, it's overlapping with concerns today. I don't want to say um, that, it, that actually, uh, that the main concern with the West Downtown Historic District, uh, I, you know, I think there's, Good evidence that the main concern was not actually hot corner, right? That there's something else going on uh, that doesn't have to do purely with the past, uh, but is rather about the present, right? And that's what historic preservation is, right? Historic preservation is never about the past, really, right? Uh, it's not about things that happened in the past. It's about significance today, okay? So, you know, preservationists, when they think about significance, right, uh, we're always taught that significance is relative. It's relative in terms of space, it's relative in terms of time, uh, and it's relative in terms of identity, right, community identity. So uh, what we mean by that is that uh, when historic districts are created, they are created for our concerns, right? Not because of good stories, right? Maybe they are good stories, but they're good because they're meaningful to us today, not because of some kind of abstract importance in history that something has, right? Preservation then is always a political act. And you know, urban space is structured really, really differently today. Uh, parts of Hot Corner remain and remain, in fact, key pieces of African-American life in Athens. And I think that that mural is testament to that, uh, as well as a number of other kinds of ritual practices that, uh, that go on in, um, in uh, Hot Corner occasionally, but then also the kind of humdrum of daily business life, which continues to go on in Hot Corner. Uh, but the black residential district along Hull Street doesn't really exist anymore, and we've already mentioned uh, the kinds of redevelopment projects that sit at the end of Hull Street. Uh, and, you know, we, we have different concerns. I've already mentioned uh, this, this distinction between uh, Cool Town and, uh, you know, the, the gown, um, you know, divided by the khaki line. Uh, you know, here in Athens, we have uh, in the West Downtown area a physical infrastructure that was mostly built out in the early to mid 20th century uh, in the time period of where Hot Corner most flourished. Um, and this, uh, this physical infrastructure is mostly churches, low-strung vernacular commercial buildings, and buildings shaped by mid-century automobile culture. 
And all of it is very much, or has been very much, under threat of redevelopment. Uh, that's both because uh, of the proximity to downtown, but it's also because of the long history of uh, long-range planning, frankly, in Athens, which has decided that uh, that's exactly what Athens wants, right? Is uh, more, um, more development, more intensive development in, in and around downtown in order to continue growing uh, while preserving the kind of outer, the agricultural land at the outskirts of Clark County, right? This has been in the long range uh, plan for you know, two decades or more uh, here in Athens. This idea that what we really want is intensive development um, in and around the downtown core. Now, uh, Athens has certainly seen a great deal of that in recent years, um, and it seems only to be accelerating. And so I think it's worthwhile to think just a little bit about what is actually going on there. Um, because it's not actually that Athens is growing that much. Um, Athens Clark County is, I mean, has at best moderate growth, okay? It's not spectacular growth in terms of population. Likewise, the University of Georgia, not actually growing that much, right? I mean, you know, it's not like we have some explosion of new undergraduate students uh, that, we're, that we're trying to house, right? Like, the number of undergraduates isn't really changing. So what's going on? Well, this is driven not by um, kind of innate consumer demand. It's not by, driven by population growth. It's driven uh, by exactly the processes uh, that we were talking about earlier uh, it's driven by kind of capital looking for uh, a, uh, a return on its investment, right? So from the perspective of global capital, um, Athens is, well, I was going to say backwater. Um, but it, I mean, not exactly a backwater. Um, it has some actually really important things about it. Uh, instead, I would call it a far-flung but really quite stable colony of a second tier city, right? Atlanta being a kind of, you know, a solidly second tier city, right? It's not New York City, it's not some, one of these superstars, but it is uh, really a, uh, a city that has a great deal of uh, capital invested in it. It uh, has a great deal of, of wealth and, um, and spending power, right? And so there is, uh, frankly, Athens is a kind of colony in some ways of Atlanta. But it's a colony unlike many others because it also has uh, this really attractive uh, stabilizing force of the University of Georgia, right? Uh, which makes Athens very different than Jefferson or you know, what, whatever other uh, kind of uh, exurb or kind of even farther than exurb uh, you would want to say. Um, so Athens, so Atlanta, in other words, is tied into global financial markets as a regional hub for the Southeast. And Atlanta's money is expressed in Athens by the large student population of the University of Georgia. Now, those consumer dollars are recaptured in Athens. And it's happening here just like it's happening all over the globe in similar university cities. Uh, not just Chapel Hill and Charlottesville or Ann Arbor and Austin, but also in Gettingen, in Bristol, in Dublin, by the construction of what uh, many have called uh, for-profit purpose-built student accommodation, uh, which is, in the words of uh, one geographer, increasingly dominating urban residential landscapes. This, this student, studentification of urban environments is a global phenomenon, driven in part by the widespread refinancialization of residential real estate uh, after the crash of 2008 uh, this sector in the economy, I, I'm still kind of early in my stages of doing research into uh, how this is operating. Uh, but as far as I can tell, it really got going uh, in the late 1990s as the college population uh, began booming, as uh, student loans became more freely given out. And uh, this sector of the economy is focused squarely on the most stable institutions, really uh, the the football schools, right? The, 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 uh, the universities, at least in the United States, with, uh, that are quite large, uh, that 
are part of the Power Six or whatever, Power Five conferences, uh, and that, uh, that therefore are, are doing really quite well. Um, some people would even say that they are uh, resistant to recession, right? And so this is one of the big draws uh, for people looking to invest capital is that uh, a lot of these areas uh, have kind of cross-cutting winds, right? Where, uh, you know, when you have a recession, you know, if someone has just lost their job, what do you do? <sighs> Graduate school, right? Uh, right, there, there's a kind of way in which uh, these, uh, these, these sites, I mean, yeah. I, hey, look, I, I, I went out onto the job market in 2008, so I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Um, but, uh, you know, the, these, these areas have something uh, to them. Um, now, this, this re, these redevelopment dollars that are kind of being funneled into Athens, moving into Athens. Uh, this is what theorist Neil Smith uh, cheekily called a back to the city movement, but by capital, not people, right? Uh, so that's really what is driving this, right? It's not increasing population. It is instead a back to the city movement uh, driven by capital. And it results, the result of this is a rent gap a gap between the potential ground rent level and the actual ground rent level. And so when you have sites that are uh, capable of uh, producing much higher rents uh, than they currently are, you have a couple different things happen. You have rehabilitation sometimes of historic structures, right? And so that's its own kind of uh, preservation fueled gentrification, right? But then you also have uh, you have the neglect of structures uh, because it's not worth investing them. If investing in them, if uh, if the rents are that you're bring, actually bringing in are so low, and so it, and eventually that would lead to abandonment, perhaps even uh, demolition by neglect. Uh, you then would also have uh, a cycle of intensive infill which is often what we're seeing right now, right? That's why we lost many of the, where, the buildings in the warehouse district uh, to the mark. It's why uh, we have uh, lost so many other buildings as well. And it's what was trying to be stopped, frankly, uh, with the proposed West Downtown Historic District. Uh, the building in, that sparked the whole thing uh, actually had nothing to do with Hot Corner. It was not a, a property within Hot Corner. It was instead the Say Building. Uh, the Say Building was owned by the United Methodist Church, First United Methodist Church, um, and there was a request to demolish this structure. Uh, they were going to turn it into a parking lot. Uh, there were some, uh, some suspicions that this uh, parking lot was a kind of uh, holding uh, holding space uh, until that uh, could be sold and redeveloped at uh, quite a premium. And so uh, city councilors uh, decided to, uh, they called for a moratorium on uh, demolitions in 2019 in order to study the issue. Uh, over the course of that year, uh, the planning staff uh, did a, a really incredible job uh, many of many preservation students here at the University of Georgia con contributed to the report. Uh, I'll, I want to mention especially uh, Professor Carrie Getches, who had done a ton of work on Hot Corner and on the West Downtown Historic District more generally, um, investigating kind of the building histories and uh, all of the things that were needed uh, for a proposed historic district. This historic district uh, encompassed uh, many of the areas that, uh, or that were already part of a national historic district uh, that, uh, that Professor James Reap had uh, first written and proposed a number of years ago. And so uh, one of the points of this uh, new historic district would be uh, to protect all of those areas which were part of the national historic district. Uh, but for those of you who are not preservation students, uh, being a part of a national historic district does not actually confer any protections on structures, right? It's only local historic districts that matter uh, for, uh, for these, uh, these protections. 
the uh, district uh, came up as, um, you know, as, as having significance in both African American history and in the history of the automobile. Uh, and so the West Downtown Historic District was proposed uh, to include you know, all of these contributing structures as well as a number of non-contributing uh, parcels in the West Downtown area, essentially going all the way down to uh, Pulaski Street and to the other side of Pulaski Street and then up to Doherty Street, right, encompassing essentially uh, the parts of downtown that were not already protected by the Athens, uh, the Athens Downtown Historic District. Uh, these included the sites in Hot Corner, uh, such as Brown's Barber Shop, which you see here, uh, the area that uh, where the Union Hall used to be, uh, but is now a parking lot. Uh, it was demolished in 1967. These images are all from the uh, draft report of the uh, that was produced by the City of Athens. Uh, you also have uh, the Manhattan Cafe, which is also part of Hot Corner, right? It's owned by uh, the, the same owners as, uh, as the rest of uh, that district along Hall Street. Wilson's uh, Barber Shops, Wilson's Styling Shop, uh, as well as uh, Wade's Market and the world famous. Uh, also within this district uh, is the former site of the Samaritan Building, which is now a surface parking lot. Uh, it was built in 1916, but demolished in the 1970s. Uh, this historic district uh, ended up um, being somewhat controversial. Um, and it certainly got a lot of attention. Uh, this is, uh, a, these are all screen captures that I took uh, from, the, uh, from the meeting before the uh, City and County Commission. Uh, you can see the people, all the people standing here, I believe all or almost all of these people spoke. Um, most, almost all of them spoke on behalf of the historic district, asking uh, the, the commissioners to uh, pass the district and to protect this part of Athens' uh, history. Um, among the speakers uh, were uh, Pamela Cohn, uh, the executive director at CINE. You can see her at the bottom uh, left of your screen. Uh, James Reap, the author of the original historic district, uh, was one of several uh, UGA faculty who spoke, uh, including uh, Professor Kerry Getchis. Uh, John Waters spoke. He founded the preservation program at the University of Georgia and was uh, a member of the landscape architecture fac uh, faculty for ma many years. Uh, Chris Blackman, the owner of Chuck's Fish, spoke, um, as did Shannon Hinson at uh, the bottom your bottom right, uh, she's a local preservationist and uh, resident, uh, uh, nearby resident of the district. A uh, former commissioner, George Maxwell, spoke. He's in the middle uh, on the left uh, and said that he was probably the only person in this room who really knew Hot Corner. Right? Uh, as a kind of long term, I think he's lived in Athens for over 75 years. Um, but then also, uh, you know, um, one, uh, the owner of the National spoke, there were students speaking, members of the University of Georgia uh, music scene spoke as well. Um, toward the end, uh, four gentlemen got up, um, three African-American gentlemen and, uh, and David Montgomery, who you see here, uh, he's being flanked by um, Homer Wilson, John Wade, and Theodore Brown. David Montgomery spoke uh, as uh, the lawyer representing the, the uh, remaining owners of uh, African American owners of the area that is Hot Corner, and he spoke in opposition to the hot, the West Downtown Historic District, right? Um, which uh, you know I think there were some insiders who had anticipated that, but I think it came to a, as a surprise to a lot of people because of a misunderstanding of the ways in which. Um, a kind of alliance between these two visions of the future of Athens uh, were kind of working. Montgomery said, if the goal of this exercise is to inhibit sales and reduce property values, well, you should come right out and say that. How ironic would it be to try to honor the history of Hot Corner by punishing the families 
who owned the property in that area. The government's thanks to them for stewarding these iconic resources will be to force the owners and their families to maintain these buildings as museums at their expense for the rest of us to enjoy. Um, now, Montgomery is not an uninterested party. Uh, I will say this. Uh, he, he's a preservationist. He lives in Lexington, Georgia. Uh, but he's also a nearby landowner uh, who opposed his own property's inclusion in this district. Um, and yet, I don't believe that an interpretation that makes him into some kind of master manipulator uh, of other actors for his own gain, I, I don't actually think that that's the right interpretation here. I think that there were many other things going on. Uh, eventually, so the, what ends up happening is the district is tabled uh, for a moment. Uh, then if you, uh, you know, this was by, this was the very end of 2019, early 2020. You guys know what happens next. Uh, so COVID uh, happens. Uh, then uh, eventually uh, the district is passed, um, but, uh, but not in the form that it was proposed, right? So here you have uh, the, the image that I'd showed earlier, the proposed West Downtown Historic District. Uh, and then what actually gets passed is much smaller and has that hole in the middle, right? Um, that hole uh, represents most of the buildings in Hot Corner, uh, the small parcels that you see along Hull Street um, right here, uh, as well as uh, the Methodist Church and uh, one of the lots right here. Um, so th there, there's a big hole in this uh, that ends up happening in this district. In addition to some jagged edges, you know, it doesn't go across Pulaski as uh, it had been hoped to, nor does it go all the way across uh, Doherty Street. So what's really going on here? If it's not uh, some uh, villain kind of manipulating things behind the scenes to, to, uh, to uh, attempt to take down the district. Well, one thing that's happening is that, uh, as we've mentioned, global capital is searching for student dollars. And that global capital search is opposed against a local alternative and progressive cultural arts scene, right? Uh, and that these are, are kind of uh, two, um, uh, two forces that are pitted against each other in this West Downtown Historic District. Uh, you, have, you have a kind of cultural conflict too between churches, many of whom uh, have, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna say that all, all, certainly not all of their members are coming from outside uh, the city, but probably some are, right? But you have churches that don't want to be um, uh, regulated in this way uh, that are uh, certainly um, against it versus a kind of not a progressive and specifically non-religious uh, culture in Athens too, right? So there's that kind of cultural conflict going on. Uh, and then perhaps most importantly, there are particular interests with particular interests in property uh, versus community and government goals. And this is what I think it, uh, really it comes down to uh, in the fate of Hot Corner and its inclusion or exclusion in this historic district, right? Is that you had uh, people extremely interested in stewarding African-American history, in, um, in uh, being good stewards of uh, the historic buildings that they uh, worked in every day and that they owned. Um, but those interests in property uh, led to them opposing the kind of collective uh, demand for right to the city, right? This collective uh, demand that the uh, desires of the Athens public be expressed in the landscape and in uh, the, the kind of um, legal mechanisms that govern capital development and redevelopment in Athens. Um, so, just as a reminder where we went during this not quite hour. Hot Corner uh, was initiated as a space for black liberation. It was created at particular moments through material and cultural action, right? Both in the material landscape, in the intangible cultural heritage of these spaces, the parade, the speech, the Morton, the daily humdrum of business, right? All of this kind of constituted uh, this rich, cultural space. And this continues to be true, right? 
black Athenians have continued to mark out these spaces uh, despite waves of redevelopment and displacement, right? Like Hot Corner still is a real, a real thing. It is a living uh, district. In many uh, places, like my hometown of Charlottesville, right, there was, a, there was a black business district there. It was called Vinegar Hill, and it was torn down completely, right? That didn't happen in Athens. Athens has suffered displacement, it's suffered some demolitions, but, we, we, but black Athenians have been able to maintain a kind of core. Um, one question that I have uh, still is, you know, th there's a concern about the overlap between different communities. Uh, to what degree are cool town Athens really allied with what we might think of as black Athens in a kind of progressive and yet still segregated city, right, uh, that, that, that often operates. Um, and I think that's a, a real question uh, that this, uh, that the hot corner controversy and the West Downtown Historic District controversy kind of get at uh, that question. Um, the passing, the last thing that I'll say is that it seems to me like the passing of the West Downtown Historic District really should be seen as a victory for preservation and yet its passing can't be without acknowledging the moral complexity, the ethical complexity of demands for a global democratic right to the city. Individual desires for human flourishing at the scale of the family, at the scale of the individual, at the scale of the city parcel, uh, will often conflict with community desires. Sometimes these conflicts are rooted inextricably in the complex histories of landscapes shaped by successive rounds of redevelopment and consecutive regimes of racial hierarchy, particularly here in Athens and places like it. Thank you. Yeah. Right, right. So, um, so uh, being in a historic district uh, basically places another set of bureaucracy, another set of design controls on significant changes uh, that one would make to one's property. Okay, so everything from changing, changing the signage, uh, whether you can paint or not paint a building, um, and uh, certainly additions, demolitions, things like that, right? They have to go through an additional layer of bureaucracy. And uh, the Preservation Commission, uh, which is a citizen board uh, for the truly significant uh, cha proposed changes, kind of oversees that and has a design guidelines that they go by uh, that, uh, that would absolutely forbid a kind of a demolition of any of these properties and a redevelopment as luxury student housing. Um, it, would, it really would um, prevent any kind of substantial redevelopment of, uh, of single story brick buildings um, on small parcels like this. Like you couldn't knock them down and then create, you know, create a, a new Georgia Heights. So I think that's the that's the concern is that um, I mean you know some of the language that uh, that Montgomery used was about like takings and things like that which is um, which is not actually true um, I mean the kind of U.S. case law has decided that as long as a reasonable return on the property can still be made that um, that, there, that there's not been a taking an illegal taking of property. Um, but, uh, but there, there really were uh, going to be more significant controls on that property. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> Amy Andrews points out uh, that paint is not part of the preservation ordinance. And I'll, I'll just say uh, what I was, what I intended to say was that painting unpainted brick. Uh, thank you, Amy, for, uh, for that, uh, that correction. Uh, so, uh, so for example, the, the unpainted brick uh, spaces could not be painted, but she's right. Uh, uh, stripes and polka dots uh, are, uh, are a-okay uh, if you want to do that in a historic preservation, in a historic district. Um, 
Any other any other questions? Mm. Right. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, so there, there's a there's a question about um, uh, Jennifer Lewis asked about uh, given that you had this kind of uh, cultural practice uh, in even in the Jim Crow era, you know, w was a historic district really the right um, the right choice? Right? Should we have should the preservation community in Athens have, have done something different? Um, I think that you can see by the fact that it failed to en encompass Hot Corner that uh, probably so. Right? I mean, these informal traditions are um, uh, are you know there's continuity between the present and the past, right? They still have a hot corner celebration, or they have, again, a hot corner celebration um, in this area of Athens. And uh, there, there is really, uh, and you, know, you see through the mural, there, there are these kinds of um, assertions of a right to the city. And yet, I, I guess what I would say is that those assertions um, are, because they are fluid, because they are cultural expressions and not uh, legally binding assertions, um, that, that's where uh, their kind of uh, fragility comes in, right? And so, um, so you need something that's not perhaps uh, what we have that comes out of a 50-year-old uh, piece of federal legislation, the, the, these uh, historic districts, right? You, you probably need something that's not a local historic district uh, that could actually, you could actually get consensus on, right? Uh, but then is also not so um, uh, so ephemeral as a cultural practice, right? And so I think it's really up to uh, us at, uh, you know, people who are interested in this stuff to really come to think about um, some other kinds of protections. And these protections uh, are needed not just here in, um, in the West Downtown Historic District, but really um, I was at a preservation, it was actually the, the October Planning Commission meeting, and there are uh, a number of buildings in East Athens that are scheduled for demolition. The only way that they were stopped uh, from demolition was because they're in an airport overlay. Now, that is not the right process to go through to stop a, a demolition, right? That, that's like a really bad practice, uh, it seems to me. And so, uh, so being innovative in thinking about the kind of heritage district that might be necessary to stop a demolition but would not have all of the, um, of the kind of uh, regulations on signage and, you know, on paint, cup, paint uh, and other kinds of things like that, right, might be... Desirable. Um, are you arguing that because they are lesser quality or vernacular, or just that it would be a more palatable? The latter. The latter. So it, it has nothing to do at all with um, with the type of structure that one is trying to. Uh, maintain much less the quote unquote quality of the residence or anything like that. Right. It's it's instead. Um, all about the politics of being able to gain um, enough political will to do it, right? So this is the concern in East Athens, uh, that, that you would never be able to get community support for a new historic district in East Athens because, uh, frankly, uh, you know, these historic districts are thought of as what the rich people's neighborhoods have, right? Um, at least that's the people who live in East Athens that I've spoken with. That's why they are against it. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that you have uh, that dynamic um, at play. So um, does that answer your question, Jennifer? Um, so I, I, I don't really have great solutions yet, but I'm, I think that, there, that we need to come up with those solutions because um, clearly there's a, there's a need for it that we're seeing. Um, do you mind if I just read these questions out, Alfie? Uh, so uh, Dr. Jane McPherson uh, asks, 
Can you speak more about the Bethel homes and how you see these same forces operating in the current redevelopment? Um, this is being recorded, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Uh, so it, uh, in my, my preservation planning students were watching, uh, there was a, a planning commission meeting just last night uh, as the, those in charge of the redevelopment were uh, requesting a, um, uh, well, they were asking to be able to put like 10 foot walls uh, right up against the sidewalk um, as part of their redevelopment work. Um, I, uh, you know, it, it seems to me like uh, the kinds of public-private partnerships that get created um, to do big redevelopment projects. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not saying that this particular one has any corruption at all, but it seems to me like if one were going to find corruption, a great place to find it would be large-scale redevelopment projects that were public-private partnerships. <laughs> um, uh, but that's without casting any aspersions. I, I know nothing about that at, at, at all. Um, but in terms of the, uh, the actual residents, right, uh, what one would say is that, look, Bethel Homes was created out of urban renewal. It was created through the demolition of a historic neighborhood, of vernacular uh, structures owned uh, largely by uh, African American residents um, in, you know, in exactly the same way that Lindentown right, uh, was, uh, was, was bulldozed uh, to make way for dormitories at the University of Georgia. This uh, redevelopment of Bethel Homes uh, is somewhat different, um, but the devil is in the details in these projects, right? So you have to ask a number of questions, right? What, how is the phasing of the project done? Uh, do you have our residents allowed and going to be enabled to move directly from their current spaces into, uh, into new spaces? Or are they going to have to just kind of find somewhere else to live for a year? And if they have to find somewhere else to live for a year, what do you think the odds are that they're going to come back, right? Um, I think that there are a lot of questions like that that uh, have yet um, to, be, to be answered. Um, you know, I, the, the fact that there is private capital seeking to, um, to take advantage of, uh, this, of this development, um, you know, I mean, that, that's just, I mean, that's the nature of redevelopment in downtown, right? Um, and so uh, I think that, you know, this, the city is doing what it can to try to, try to find solutions uh, for um, for affordable housing in Athens, I mean, you know, there are different theories about how to go to go about that. Uh, one theory that seems to me to be played out is the idea that well, just create enough units, keep building more and more luxury student housing, and you have more and more units, and supply and demand will mean that you'll have dropping prices. I don't see rent prices dropping, right? Uh, despite the fact that uh, our uh, creation of housing far outpaces um, the, uh, the actual uh, increase in population that we have. Um, so, uh, so instead we've turned to like taking money from developers, right? So every time a new development project comes before the planning commission, um, you know, frankly, there aren't good, the city doesn't have good guidelines on it. And so they just got like throw out a number. I'll give you a million dollars to the city for affordable housing. Um, if you let me create this, uh, this new, uh, 300 uh, bedroom, uh, huge, massive development downtown. Um, and then we have to kind of think about that. Right? Um, seems like not particularly effective. Yes? Um, I have a question about going the opposite direction of mm -hmm. downtown, more so mm -hmm. going like um, southeast, like in the Berkeley Park area. Mm -hmm. As you can watch in the Okay, so uh, so you're thinking, uh, so no, I mean, the, sh the short answer is no, not, not around Dudley Park, I don't think. Uh, so the historic districts in Athens, um, uh, so let me see, it, actually the next question, uh, one more question here is about these other historic districts. Um, 
But uh, no, there are not protections, uh, in case you were wondering. I, I don't believe around the Dudley Park area, which is like west of, um, that's kind of west, kind of out toward the loop, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Dudley Park. Yeah. Oh, Dudley Park there. Right. Excuse me. Yeah. East Athens has no protections, essentially. Yeah. 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 So, um, so right. So that's uh, like Little Oak Street is where they, they block things um, at the uh, airport overlay. Um, yeah. So you guys are in the center of it. And frankly, without a, a, um, a river redevelopment plan, which I think uh, that's actually going to be adhered to and like a strong Riverfront redevelopment plan. Um, I mean, that's what I would hope for uh, instead of just building more and more and more student housing, uh, which is what's happened. Like just in October, they just tabled yet another huge project um, on Mitchell Street. So uh, you can expect more. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. Um, you know, people like me. And so I just, I, I know that there are all these neighborhoods where I wouldn't have gone, I guess, if I had stayed not taking the seminar. Um, and there seems to be a big bubble between students who are attending the University of Georgia and then mm -hmm. local Athenian youth. And I don't know what, what the role is. Hmm. Right, right. Um, okay, that's, that's a really good question. So um, I, let me say a couple things about that. Um, so gentrification and studentification are huge processes that operate at not the scale of the individual, but at the scale of the globe, right? Um, I mean, we, we've been talking about the kind of ties between global financial capital and these uh, interventions. Um, and so what would be the least useful thing would be to feel guilty about one's uh, participation in these processes, right? Like that's not actually helpful. Um, and I don't think actually that responsibility is borne by individuals who are just going about their lives living in a place um, and trying to live their best life and pursue their dreams, right? Like um, I think that actually there's full absolution for graduate students. Um, uh, but then, then, like, how do you break down uh, those walls as a graduate student? Um, you know, I, I think that's a great question. Uh, I mean, one is, like, be a good neighbor, right? So, like, pick up your trash. You know, not, like, trash the public uh, right-of-ways, things like that, which I'm sure you don't. Um, uh, you know, some people would say volunteer and, and things like that. I think that's actually a limited use. Uh, and actually the volunteers get way more out of that kind of stuff than um, most of the people. But, you know, but, you know, there are some organizations like Hands on Athens that you could participate with, things like that. Um, you know, I, I would say just to the degree that you can participate in like non-student activities as a peer with, uh, in other organizations. Um, is the best thing that you can do. So that you can kind of embrace this, and this I'm thinking specifically of graduate students, right? Like you're kind of in between, right? You're, you're not an undergraduate student either, right? You're, you are a student, but you're also in some ways a resident that, um, that is of a different stripe. Um, and so I think embracing that kind of hybrid identity is, uh, is one of the cool things actually about graduate school. Um, that was it, my experience anyway. Um, when I was a graduate student elsewhere. Um, Amy Andrews writes, Reese Street is the only black neighborhood in Athens, which is a local historic district beside that small section of Rock Springs. What is your perspective on the success or failure of protecting other traditional black neighborhoods through local historic designation? And this gets to your question about East Athens, frankly, and about uh, Dudley Street. Um, so she's asking specifically about West Hancock, Newtown, et cetera. These neighborhoods are undergoing gentrification just as East Athens is. Will designation be to their detriment? Um, frankly, no. I, I, I don't think that designation would be to their detriment. I think it's going to be politically difficult to get any of these passed. Um, and so 
to that degree, you might want to seek some kind of alternative de designation of a, a, a kind of heritage district or something like that that would forbid demolitions, but would be have really light um, kind of other, other kinds of controls on the material uh, fabric. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the, you know, once a, a building and especially like a streetscape or a, um, or a street pattern is obliterated, like you see at uh, where uh, Bethel is, right? Like that's the, those are the threats. Those are re the really big threats, I think, to commemoration and to culture. Um, you know, I think, uh, frankly, the, the worst thing is huge, is big capital, right? That's what really tears neighborhoods apart, right? Either no capital or big capital. Um, and historic districts can hopefully um, moderate, serve as a moderating force. Um, so I, I would not be against designation of some of these places. I just think it, it might be politically uh, impossible frankly, uh, because you'd be fighting um, skeptical neighbors who don't want those controls in addition to fighting developers, right? And that, that's, that's quite a, a, com a combo uh, to have a raid against one if, if one is, right? And, you know, you don't want to do something that residents wa don't want to do, right, as a preservationist, because preservation is not a goal in and of itself. It is uh, a discipline that, uh, that seeks human flourishing in various kinds of contexts, right? Uh, in ecological contexts, in, uh, in environmental ones, in, um, in suburbs, in urban spaces, in rural spaces, right? Uh, the point of preservation is that we believe uh, that preservation, preserving our heritage uh, is conducive to uh, the long-term flourishing of communities. Um, so preservation for communities, not the other way around. Thank you. That seemed like a great way to end. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. That was uh, so interesting and, and thought-provoking. Uh, thank you all. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs>